Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for coming. It's great to see a lot of people um, here tonight. And thank you very much, John, for joining us again. My pleasure. And it's, it's great to have you. Thank you. Um, the way this is going to work this evening is we'll start with a brief Q&A between me and John, and then I'll open up the floor for audience questions. There are people with microphones about, so if you wait for that to get to you, just make sure we can get your question heard. So, so just off the bat, um, what was your motivation for going into politics and then subsequently being Speaker of the House? Well, first of all, thank you very much indeed for having me. Uh, thank you for the warmth and generosity of that welcome. And perhaps I can just be forgiven, Christopher, for asking, can you hear me, I say, looking randomly at the woman in my immediate line of vision at the back? Can you hear me at the back? Well, I'm grateful to you both for signalling that you can do so and for being not entirely distraught about the fact that you can hear me. And I do want to say to you, just as our little secret within these four walls, that that response that you can hear me with a smile represents a notable improvement on the last occasion on which I was asked that self-same question. I said to the audience, can you hear me at the back? to which some unhelpful wag replied, yes, but I'll happily change places with someone who can't. <laughs> so the fact that you can hear me is very encouraging. What caused me to want to go into politics? If I'm really brutally honest about it. I think at the time I had a very keen sense of personal ambition. In a general sense, I wanted to be a good MP and to do good work and be a good representative. But if I look back at my young self, can I in all honesty say, as politicians often do and frequently mean, that I was overridingly preoccupied with the interests of the country? I don't think I was. I think I was mainly keen to get up and get on and advance my cause. I think the longer I was there, Christopher, the more I came to think about my constituency and the constituents and the causes that mattered to them and to me, to my party, to the country. So I think I started off in a funny sort of way, less idealistic and more self-seeking. And the longer I was there, I became more idealistic and more preoccupied with the country. Why did I want to be Speaker? The very short answer to that question is that I didn't want to be a minister, I didn't think I would be a very good minister, and I didn't think I had much chance of being asked, for a variety of reasons you can probe if you wish, by David Cameron to be a minister. But I suppose I was sufficiently ambitious, egocentric, call it what you will, to think, well, I enjoy being an ordinary MP, but I've always loved Parliament, I've loved debate, I've loved the concept of fair exchange, debating points of view, hearing everybody, and I think I could do something more than be a backbencher. And if a vacancy, or the vacancy for Speaker, arises, and I've got a reasonable shot at it, in other words, if I judge that I've got a reasonable chance of not disgracing myself in the vote, but of getting a decent vote, then I'm inclined to go for it. And the Truth of the matter is that I had somebody on the Conservative side inquiring who might support me, and someone on the Labour side asking, well, might you support John? And those people reported back to me, not that I was in any sense certain to win, but that I had a decent chance of winning and that I would certainly get a substantial vote. And so I resolved to have a go. And the reality is that from the back end of 2004... I had decided that I'd like one day to be Speaker, and I got the chance in 2009, and I've never regretted it. Uh, if you do regret it, there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> I cannot help you, but I gave it my best shot. Do you think it's quite common for politicians to enter, as you did, sort of self-ambition and then become more ideological? Or do you actually think that's quite rare? <laughs> It's very difficult to know because those aren't conversations, even though you might think they should take place, that do. I think most of us in politics tend to say we're in it for the public good. And to be fair, we 
think that we are. But I don't see any point in coming to the Cambridge Union and doing this session without being scrupulously honest to a fault, utterly candid. And I'm retired from politics. I could come along and say, oh, well, I was always overridingly motivated by the pursuit of the public good. But you asked me the question, why did I want to become an MP? I was ambitious. I enjoyed debate. I liked the cut and thrust of argument. I had strong views. And I also thought, well, I could do a really good job and I'd like to get on. I think it's always a mistake to say you're in a category of one. I think that would be very presumptuous and arrogant. I'm sure there are other people who have become more idealistic as they've gone on. I don't think it's right in this context to name names, particularly where conversations have been very personal. But I can think of one member I knew, a Labour member, who served in the government whip's office. And he was what you would call an adherent of the thuggery rather than charm school of whipping. That is to say, he was inclined to get people through the division lobby in support of the Labour government, not by being frightfully charming or telling people how capable they were and how he'd very much like to be able to recommend them for promotion if only they felt able to come through the lobby with the government tonight. And most unfortunate, because you're such a capable person, if I have to tell the Prime Minister that, regrettably, you weren't prepared to support him or her tonight. No, this chap was more incline almost to grab you by the lapels and try to frog march you through the lobby. He didn't do it to me because I wasn't a Labour member, but I saw the way he operated. He eventually got sacked from the government whip's office because there was a change of regime and several whips were removed at once. And this guy reinvented himself as an absolutely dedicated, principled and assiduous backbencher who having for years not been much bothered about the rights of Parliament. You understand, students, he was a member of the executive. He was a member of the government as a government whip. Government whips just want to get the business through. They're not really interested in the niceties of parliamentary procedure, other than how they can be manipulated to serve the government. This fellow reinvented himself and became very concerned about the rights of Parliament. Now, was that conversion or that transformation authentic and wholesale? It absolutely was. It absolutely was. He was a very genuine guy. And I remember once saying to him, you know, your approach has changed. And he said, John, I was in the machine. I quite enjoyed being a part of the machine. Once I was kicked out of the machine, I decided to have a kind of midlife rethink and do things rather differently. So I wouldn't say I'm alone, but I think probably I'm slightly odd in saying, well, I'm, actually, I'm slightly odd in all sorts of ways. We haven't got time to go into that. But I'm probably slightly odd in saying that I started off, you know, with rampant ambition and in the end became much more concerned about whether what I was doing was good for the country or not. Yeah, you touched on a little bit there, but when you were younger, um, I think it's fair to say your, your views were different from what they are today. Um, I think you described them as boneheaded before. And one of those was about the repatriation of immigrants. So do you think that the government's Rwanda policy is also boneheaded? I think the government's uh, immigration policy is extremely misguided. And I think it's very unpleasant. And it pains me to see the government implementing a policy which is neither effective nor fair. It is absolutely true, Christopher, you should pay tribute to your president. He's done his homework. He's prepared well for this role of interlocutor tonight. By background, I was very right-wing in my youth, partly influenced by my late father, but I have to take some ownership of my own political journey. And as you say, I was rabidly anti-immigration in the early 1980s. Though, if you believe, students, in the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act of 1974, the title of which explains its purpose and content, I hope you will regard me as forgiven, as I did resign for the, from the Immigration Committee of the Right Wing Monday Club in February 1984, having ceased to have anything to do with it 12 months before. So it's almost 40 years ago 
And I take, I suppose, what you would call a liberal position on immigration. My view is, for what it's worth, immigration has been overwhelmingly a positive for the country, not a negative. It's done much more good for us than it's done harm. And I am genuinely saddened to see successive Conservative Home Secretaries taking what I regard as a populist, reactionary, negative and damaging approach both to the subject of immigration and, for that matter, to that of asylum. These are big problems that cannot be tackled by one country acting alone. The phenomenon of people fleeing persecution, war, disadvantage, diabolical, tyrannical, sometimes treacherous regimes that commit terrible acts of misdeed against their own people. And it is natural that in those circumstances, people flee from persecution and seek safe haven. And traditionally, this country has had a reputation for giving sanctuary to such people and for an attitude of care, concern and commitment. And I fear that's gone out of the window in recent times. As far as immigration is concerned, you can't have unlimited immigration. Of course, there have to be controls on immigration. But I must say I do very strongly object to some of the rhetoric of the tabloid press in particular. I think they've got a lot to answer for. The Daily Mail, the Daily Fail, as I call it, the Daily Express, and so on. I've got very unpleasant attitudes to these matters. And, you know, I regard it as most unfortunate, let me put it like that, most unfortunate that the current Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, takes the stance that she does. It may play well with the Conservative Party conference or the Conservative grassroots, but that's a very different thing from being either right or fair. If, so why is then the Rwanda policy government policy? Is it because Rishi Sunak is a weak Prime Minister or is it because he actually believes in it? I think he probably believes in it himself. I think he's also hemmed in by a very divided party of which the more vociferous part is stridently right wing. Uh, do I think Rishi Sunak himself is the most stridently right wing representative of that genre? I don't. He was, if you like, in the recent leadership contest, the more moderate, reasonable candidate. But the Conservative Party isn't moderate or reasonable. It is rabidly right-wing. It is unrecognisable from the Conservative Party of the 1980s. People often talk about Margaret Thatcher as being a very right-wing leader. And, of course, I knew Margaret Thatcher, and she was a right-wing leader, and she was a very controversial figure. But by comparison with the modern Conservative Party, Mrs Thatcher could be very pragmatic and reasonable at times. And I'm sorry to say, I think the Conservative Party has become more and more and more abrasive, ideological, right-wing and reactionary. And the Rwanda policy is an example of that, but there are other examples of that as well. And I think it's a great pity. Rishi Sunak would have to answer for himself as to why he takes the stance that he does. I regard him as a personable individual. I always got on with him perfectly well when we were in the house together. I knew him for four and a half years. He's actually quite a capable guy. I have to say to you, students, I do not get the impression that this is a prime minister who is in command of his own government. I don't get the impression he's in command of his own government. I get the impression of a man who is the hapless prisoner of his own massively divided an increasingly stridently right-wing party. And I must apologise to you, Christopher, and to all members of this audience for being so gentle, softly spoken and understated about this matter, but I'm doing my best to overcome my natural shyness and reticence and to tell you what I really think. I regard it as a positively shaming indictment after nearly 40 years, 40 years involvement in politics, if I go to an audience and they say, well... Trouble is, I don't know what he said. I couldn't hear them. <laughs> I've never normally had that problem. Yeah, it's my problem, not yours. Um, so do you think that Rishi is capable of changing the Conservative Party, or can it even change, or is it too gone? I don't think the Conservative Party is going to change this side of an election. Look, I'm not as close to the situation as I was when I was in the House. I just 
read news media and listen to electronic feeds and so on and have a look at what's on the internet as the rest of you do. And my reading of the situation is that the government isn't in any meaningful sense governing. It's not really addressing issues. The schools bill was abandoned. The pursuit of new housing targets was dropped when there was a backbench protest against it. The government is dropping policies that it thinks might be controversial. And at the first whiff of grape shot from MPs saying, we're not going to accept this, we're going to rebel against that, we're going to go into the division lobby against the other, the government seems to recoil from the fray. It doesn't want to be in the heat of the battle. And instead it says, right, we'll put that off. What's my interpretation of matters? I think that Rishi Sunak probably wants to try to get on top of inflation over the next year or so and see if he can slash the rate of inflation, a rate of inflation, I may say, which has been caused very considerably by the extraordinarily misguided and industrially inept policies of his own predecessor. And I guess he feels that if he can get on top of inflation and re-establish some sort of economic stability, the punters might forgive him and the Conservative Party at the next election. Do I think that's very likely? I don't think it's very likely. There are no certainties in politics. The Tory party is a ruthless beast. It will do anything it can to stay in office. It's got a great appetite for power. My sense is that it's been in power for too long. It's run out of time. It's run about, out of ideas. It's run out of energy. It's run out of road. And I think it will soon be run out of office. So, you know, if you ask me, do I think the next government is more likely to be a Labour government or a Conservative government, I think the next government is more likely to be a Labour government. And the historic challenge for the Conservative Party, which I think it will meet, to be fair, I don't think it's finished, I don't think that, the historic challenge for the Conservative Party will be what it's always been when it's lost office. What do we learn from it? How do we reinvent ourselves? How do we adapt to the new challenges of society or the mores of the country. So I'm not one of those people who says, oh, the Conservative Party is finished for good. I think that's a very dangerous prediction. There used to be books written by quite serious, high-minded academics in the 80s, Must Labour Lose? And titles analogous. The theme being, is Labour finished for good? And there were some people who thought, almost on the basis of demographics, the changing makeup of the country, the decline of the industrial working class and so on, that the Labour Party was destined forever to lose. And that was wrong. I don't take a kind of determinist view. I think that parties can recover and reshape, reform themselves. Labour has done it, the Conservatives have done it. I think the Conservative Party will probably do it again. But the Conservative Party has been in office for a very long time and it has done very considerable harm and it is high time that it was ejected from office sooner rather than later. So I take it you support Labour. <laughs> and <laughs> yes, I think I, I would like to see I would like to see a Labour government. I think it would be in the interests of the country for there to be a change. I think that the challenges that will face any incoming government will be immense. There are very real strains in the public finances. There is considerable indebtedness. There's the challenge of trying to secure global growth as well as growth in this country. No country can act entirely alone. There are all sorts of forces at work. And I don't think that the next government of whichever complexion will find it easy. But I think it would be helpful to have a government that was obviously on the side of and busting a gut in terms of policy administration and commitment for the mass of the electorate. And I think the problem of the Conservative Party at the moment is that it has done a great deal of harm to people's living standards by the policies that it's pursued. And I'm afraid at the top, it is populated heavily by people who have got very little experience of, let alone empathy with, people struggling to get by. It doesn't understand those people. And I think Keir Starmer has got a better understanding of those people than Rishi or his colleagues. I'm going to go to a bit about Rishi's predecessor, just a little bit. Um, so at the moment, the chairman of the BBC, um, Richard Sharp, is 
sort of quite notoriously embroiled in a cronyism scandal about his appointment by Boris Johnson. Do you think that Richard Sharp should resign as chairman of the BBC? The truth is that I don't feel fully knowledgeable about the detail, and I think there is still some uncertainty about that. I know he has said, as I understand it from the news media today, that there was no conflict of interest. I think the answer to that, students, if I may say so, is ultimately that is for others to judge. He's entitled to a profession of innocence. Of course he's entitled to say that if he believes it to be true. If he doesn't think there's a conflict of interest, he's perfectly entitled to say so. But ultimately, others will judge whether there was. I think there are questions to answer. I think there are very serious questions to answer. Very serious questions for Boris Johnson who is a, a ghostly presence in all of our proceedings at all times, and very serious questions for the chairman of the BBC to answer. And I think that just trying to damp down the story by saying, there is no issue here, we move on, and the Yabu sucks to the opposition for trying to stir it or for the media that wish to cover it, that won't wash. This is a big issue. This person, a very prominent donor to the Conservative Party and apparently very well disposed to and a friend of Boris Johnson, is said to have been involved in one way or another in helping him secure a very substantial financial facility and has become chairman of the BBC. Now, he may say that those two phenomena are wholly unrelated and there is nothing that should be the cause of suspicion. I think you would accept that transparency is all. The facts have to be out there in relation to that matter and indeed in relation to the matter of Nadim Zahawi, the Conservative Party chairman who carelessly neglected to pay a few million pounds in tax. Should he resign as chair of the Conservative Party? Well, I'm sorry to say that I just don't think Nadim Zahawi has any credibility as chairman of the Conservative Party. And again, I should say to you, you will understand, students, that I knew these people because I worked with them in the House. Do I have any personal grudge against Nadim Zahawi? No, I always found him personable. We got on well. Uh, he's an amiable character. He's a person of considerable ability. Uh, he was well regarded in some of his ministerial roles. But what has arisen is a big issue. And I think there is a huge question mark over him. And I think Nadim is probably experienced enough now to know that the story won't go away. And simply threatening to use lawyers to close down newspapers that take an interest isn't going to be effective. The question is, did he negotiate with Revenue and Customs to solve his tax issues while he was Chancellor of the Exchequer, with the Chancellor bearing overall responsibility for Revenue and Customs? If he did, there is a clear conflict of interest there. Did he, when he was interviewed, I think on Sky some months ago, tell the truth when he said that his interests were all declared and there was no issue as far as his tax was concerned. Was it not the case that at that time the question of what he might or might not owe in tax was in play, was the subject of negotiation? I don't know for certain it was, but I asked that question. Can he square what he said in that interview with, I think, Kay Burley, with what we now suspect? And was he open with the Prime Minister about his circumstances. Now, it's not for me to give a conclusive answer to those questions, but those questions do have to be answered. And the Prime Minister has gone from a position of saying only a few days ago, last week, that Mr Zahawi had given a full account and explained the position and there was nothing further to be said on the matter, to saying that there are clearly serious questions that need to be answered. And he's asked his ethics advisor stroke investigator fully to probe the situation. So the situation has changed literally within the space of the week. If you ask me on balance, do I think Mr Zahawi will be able to survive in government? Uh, the honest answer is no. I don't think he will be able to do so. Could the Conservative Party do anything to bring you back into the fold or are you resigned from it? 
No, no, I left the Conservative Party on the night of the 22nd of June 2009 when I had the great good fortune and privilege to be elected Speaker. And that was in conformity with the convention that the Speaker doesn't belong to, is independent of, owes no obligation to and expresses no support for any political party. I wasn't a member of any other party, therefore. But, you know, I'm quite open about the fact that I would like to see a Labour government. I think the Labour Party today is a very different party to that which I saw when I first became involved in politics 40 years ago. And if you ask me why would I like to see a Labour government, I think the Labour Party is much more economically responsible than it once was. I think it has an internationalist vision, which I share, as opposed to a Little Englander outlook. And I think that, above all, the Labour Party is committed to a notion of social justice, which I think should be at the core of public service. So that's why I would like to see a change of government. Would I be interested in going back into the Conservative Party? No. And in a spirit of self-knowledge, I ought just candidly to say to you, students, and to you, Christopher, not only do I not want to go back to the Conservative Party, the Conservative Party wouldn't remotely want it to go anywhere near it. <laughs> and I can reassure members of the Conservative Party that I have no intention of going anywhere near that party again. Um, final question before I go to the floor for your guys' questions. Um, there have been issues across parties and sort of across politics more generally with bullying and harsh work environments. Why do you think that is? And is that just the nature of working in politics? I think there can be a very highly charged atmosphere in the House. I think members are operating under great pressure. In some cases, don't have extensive experience of running an office, of employing staff, and can get involved in conflict situations. If you ask me, students, did I sense during my 10 years as Speaker that bullying across the House service was an issue on any scale, the honest answer is that I didn't have the sense that it was an issue on any significant scale. And the staff representatives in the House, that is to say the staff trade unions and the senior staff at the top of the House service, never said to me, you know, they do come to the Speaker all the time, you have meetings with senior officials, with trade union colleagues and so on, they never said to me, Mr Speaker, there's a real issue of bullying in the House. So I didn't sense that there was. As far as I personally am concerned, because it was concluded that I had maltreated a number of members of staff, I can say only this. Look, to err is human. We're all flawed. We all make mistakes. Do I claim that I got it right every time? I don't. Uh, what I do say is that I was in the House for 22 years. I was never subject to investigation by the Parliamentary Standards Commissioner at any time in my 22 years in the House, which certainly is not something that, for example, Boris Johnson could claim, or a great many other people could claim. I was never investigated, let alone judged adversely by the Parliamentary Standards Commissioner. I had fabulous relationships with people right across the House very significant numbers of members of staff whom I hugely esteemed and who appeared to think well of me. And in the Speaker's office, which is quite a small office of about 10 people, I had people who worked for me and with me from day one, June the 22nd, 2009, until I stood down at the beginning of November 2019. There were people who worked with me uninterruptedly for 10 years. People leave, of course, people go and get other jobs, people move sector, people go abroad and so on, but I had other people who worked for me for eight years, for seven years, I had a number of people who worked for me for five years. I got on superbly with all of them. When I left office, three people came forward and said, ah, oh, Mr Burko maltreated me. And we went through an extremely protracted and long-winded process a great deal of effort was spent and time devoted to drawing up lists of witnesses, including into whether, for example, I had barked at somebody 10 years previously. One of the allegations where the investigator refused to interview the witnesses. I mean, this is surreal, but it's true. 
One of the allegations was that I'd stared at somebody in a hostile way. And I said to the investigator, forgive me, may I just ask, when was this? Uh, well, I, I don't know, Mr. Burke, but, uh, well, during your period of office. And I said, well, I think I grasped that. But, uh, sorry, when? And he, he said, well, he didn't know. So I said, well, can you tell me what was the subject matter? And he told me. And as people who know me well will testify, I have many flaws, but I've got a pretty good memory. And I said, yes, I remember exactly that matter. It related to an absolute crusading passion of mine to establish the Speaker's Parliamentary Placement Scheme, a scheme whereby people of ability and commitment who cared about politics and wanted to work in the House but had no dosh at all, didn't, couldn't depend on the bank of mum and dad, I wanted to establish a scheme that would give those people a chance to work as paid interns, if you like, in the House. And I did establish that scheme. But there was some resistance to it from one or two officials for reasons that are too tedious to go into, but eventually, it, pretty quickly, it was set up. And we had two meetings of the House of Commons Commission at which it was discussed. And I happened to remember that one of them was in November 2010 and the other was in January 2011. And this chap didn't know that, didn't seem to think it mattered. And I said, yes, I remember exactly what matters were discussed. I remember that issue. You're saying I stared at somebody in a hostile way. Yes, he said, my judgment is that you did. And I said to him, forgive me, in your draft report... You don't quote any of the nine witnesses, the people who were present at that meeting, who are still alive. One sadly has died, but nine are still alive, and you could have interviewed them. And he said, no, no, he didn't intend to interview those witnesses, because as it was so long ago, they wouldn't remember. So I said, well, they certainly wouldn't remember something that didn't happen, but with great respect, your draft thesis is that it did happen. In that circumstance, I very politely suggest to you that the laws of natural justice would tend to dictate that you should at least ask the witnesses what they remember about this matter. I'm accused of staring, not once, not momentarily, but fixedly and with hatred at a particular person. And I said, I did no such thing. And I challenge you to ask the witnesses. No, no, he didn't. He said, with great respect, Mr. Berko, I'm running this investigation, not you. And I said, yes, you are. You're running it very badly. <laughs> yeah. So look... Am I flawed? Do I make mistakes? Do I occasion have I occasionally lost my rag over the years? You could probably see it in the chamber with some discordant noise being made or some very badly behaved individual. But did I maltreat people? I don't believe I did. I tell you what I did do, students. I did set about reforming the House of Commons. I tried to deliver reform in the chamber with greater vitality and urgency of questioning, granting hundreds of urgent questions, which are now commonplace, but when I became speaker they weren't, to make the process of political interrogation livelier and more topical, more relevant. I resolved to bring about change across the parliamentary estate. When I took up post as speaker, we had a shooting gallery in parliament where you could go pistol shooting, but no nursery where MPs and staff could pay to place their kids to facilitate a better work-life balance, enable them to do their jobs as MPs whilst ensuring that their children were safe. And I resolved to change that. And by the time I finished, I'm very pleased to tell you the shooting gallery had been closed down, but the nursery was an extremely thriving, well-attended facility as it is to this day. And I resolved to ensure that we had a much more diverse set of people in the higher echelons of the House. I made five BAME appointments at senior levels in the House on merit, up against much opposition. I had to argue for the use of specialist recruitment consultants so that we could reach out into BAME communities, so we could reach out to audiences from which we would get more female applicants. And this was thought to be a rum business, as somebody said to me, rum business. Mr. Speaker, why do you feel the need to do this? And I said, because the House at the staff, on the staff side is disproportionately at the higher levels, white, male, middle class, and unrepresentative of the country that we're charged to represent. And I want to make the House more diverse. But do I have scars on my back from some of those battles? I do. There was resistance. And I insisted as the elected Speaker on doing it my way, just as I insisted that I would chair the Youth Parliament every year for 10 years, and I insisted on going to the Youth Parliament's conference, if they wanted me, which fortunately for me they did, every year to talk to them. And I had a very senior member come up to me, students florid of face, 
flecks of spittle coming off his face at mine. And he said to me, Mr. Speaker. And I said, yes. He said, I understand that you intend to chair the proceedings of the UK Youth Parliament in weeks to come. And I said, yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, proceedings, Mr. Speaker, to which I am virulently opposed. And I said, yes, uh, I'm perfectly well aware that you're opposed to those proceedings. Frankly, anybody with a 50-mile radius of the House of Commons would, would have been well aware of the opposition of this character because he'd spoken in the debate against allowing the Youth Parliament to come to Westminster. And I said, yes, but with great respect, that matter was debated was debated just before I became Speaker, and the House resolved that we would invite the Youth Parliament once a year. Yes, he said, but it's not necessary for you to chair the proceedings, sanctifying these proceedings, Mr Speaker, with the authority of your office. And I said, it may not be necessary in your judgment, but it is in mine. I intend to chair the proceedings of the Youth Parliament for two reasons. First, I admit I will enjoy doing so. Secondly, what better signal of welcome an inclusion could one offer to those young people than for the speaker to bother to turn up and sit there from start to finish. I make no criticism of my predecessor, Christopher, who, who is no longer with us and can't defend himself. My predecessor, Michael Martin, was a Scottish MP and he liked to be in his constituency on a Friday, which I absolutely understand. That was his main home. That's where he wanted to be. And... So he wasn't intending to chair the proceedings. He was going to let the deputy speaker, Sir Alan Hazelhurst at the time, chair the proceedings. I decided when I became speaker, I'm going to take this over. And I chaired the proceedings. This complaining member, who was positively volcanic in his rage, said to me, you mark my words, Mr Speaker. If you chair the proceedings of the youth parliament, it will be a disaster. At the very least, he said, I remember it to this day, I remember exactly where he was standing, he said, at the very least, chewing gum will be left all over the chamber. <laughs> and at the worst, he said, pen knives will be used <laughs> and damage will be inflicted on these benches, which I love. And I said to him, I respect your right to your point of view and for being direct with me, but I do not respect the calumny and vituperation that you're lobbying in the direction of the young people. And I make three predictions to you. They'll be proud to come, they'll speak well, and they'll behave a damn sight better than we do. <laughs> and if I may say so, Christopher, I say this in support of the Youth Parliament, of whom I became a champion and, and who were very kind to me. I say this in their support, not mine. I was right on all three counts. So the point that I'm making here is that, as somebody once said to me, a very experienced former leader of the House, said to me, John, you can either be a reforming speaker or you can be an uncontroversial speaker, but you cannot be both. And I said to him, I intend, as I said in my campaign, to bring about change in this place. And if that means ruffling some feathers and taking on some vested interests, so be it. I didn't want to be speaker just so I could say to my children and, God willing, one day my grandchildren, look, I served as speaker. I actually wanted to make a difference. And I tried to do so, but I was up against a minority of very determined and reactionary forces. And for fighting against those reactionary forces, I have not apologised, I do not apologise, and I will not apologise. And as far as I'm concerned, those people could like it or lump it. Thank you very much. We're now going to turn to audience questions. So please raise your hand and then wait for a microphone to come to you. You might need this one, Masket. Um, let's just start. Uh, man in the scarf. Yeah. Ah. Thank you very much for this great talk already at this point. Can you hear me? Does this microphone work? Fantastic. I can hear you. Thank you. Great. Uh, since your time as a speaker also collided with the time of the Brexit, I had a twofold question in this matter. First, what do you think the politicians could have done better at the time of Brexit? And secondly, do you think the Brexit could and also should have been prevented after the vote was cast in the end? What could the politicians have done better? I think, if I can put it this way, students, on both sides of the divide, they could have done better as follows. I think those who wanted Brexit, or at any rate who in government 
were committed to deliver Brexit. It's not quite the same thing, because Theresa May, for example, didn't want Brexit, but she was nevertheless keen to become Prime Minister and to deliver it. Those who wanted Brexit should have had a better idea of what they meant by Brexit. Because as I pointed out in a lecture I gave at London University last week on the subject of Brexit, there was a delay of two years between the referendum in June 2016 and Dominic Raab as Brexit secretary presenting the government white paper, that is to say the intention as to how to deliver Brexit, in July 2018 to the House of Commons. Now, what does that mean? It means that those who wanted Brexit hadn't worked out what Brexit meant. And I've always remembered when David Davis was Brexit secretary, somebody I've known for 30 years and is a bright guy, but I remember David coming to the House and making an extraordinary statement on Brexit in, I think, September 2016, which was full of platitudes about committing himself to the national interest and safeguarding the interests of the country and proceeding with Brexit and so on. You know, I mean, I would have been a bit surprised if he'd come and said, my firm intention, I must say to my honourable and unhonourable friends and to the people on the opposition benches, is to ensure that I do everything possible to disadvantage the national interest. I mean, that would have been absurd. Obviously, he was going to say he was going to try to do something in the national interest. He didn't have any substance. He didn't have any detail. He didn't have any clear proposals. And I remember at the end of that statement, I called everybody who wanted to question David, who looked surprisingly upbeat and chipper, considering he had nothing to say... I remember an SNP member, Stephen Gethins, with split-second timing, calling out when he sat down. Is that it? <laughs> Meaning, haven't you got any more flesh on the bones? And my very senior colleague, Ken Clark, who's gone to the House of Lords now, very experienced Conservative politician and Cabinet Minister in the House for 49 years until he retired in 2019, I remember Ken Clark getting up in his rather good-natured way and saying, Can I say to my honourable friend, the... Secretary of State, uh, listen very carefully to what he said, and I would urge him to take as long as possible to identify what the government thinks it means by the delivery of Brexit. In other words, what he was really saying is it's not at all clear, it's as clear as mud as of today, get it right. So I think the Brexiteers should have had a much clearer idea. I think when we got to the votes in the Commons, it's very easy to criticise... I think it would have been good if those who were against the government's position had been able to agree on an alternative. And very late in the day, we had things called indicative votes. Some non-government MPs came to me and said, Mr Speaker, we know the government normally controls the order paper, the agenda for the day. Is it all right if we try to suspend the standing order and take control of the business because the government didn't have a majority? And I said, yes, it's legitimate in my judgment, for you to try to do that. As to whether you win the vote, I don't know. That's not a matter for me. I gave them permission to table a suspension of standing orders, and they won that vote. And those members, members from both sides of the House, who were not keen on the May-Johnson approach, put forward a, a day's business where you would be able to vote on all sorts of different options. The problem was, students, that people were absolutely committed to their own option and weren't prepared to settle for anything other than their own. So I can think of one member who wanted a, a kind of customs union membership for Britain, which we don't have now under Brexit, but we could have done in theory if the House had willed it. He wanted that, but he was against having another referendum. Absolutely against, because he was on principle opposed to referendum. He hadn't approved of the first referendum. He certainly didn't want a second. And I can think of another person, a friend of mine as it happens, who wanted a second referendum... And I remember him saying to me privately, just as human being to human being, I'm damned if I'm going to vote under any circumstances for the customs union proposal. He said, it's a second referendum for me or nothing. So the fact that they didn't compromise meant that in the end, Boris Johnson seized the initiative and said, this House is not resolving this matter. I am going to suggest that we have a general election. And in the end, the election came and Johnson who is lousy at governing but very good at campaigning, won the election, and the rest is history. So that's the honest answer. It could have been done differently, but it wasn't. As far as I personally am concerned, I can say only this. 
I don't know of any speaker, particularly during controversial times, who escapes scot-free from criticism. There's always criticism and controversy. People always spot bias where they want to spot it. And I was accused of being biased on the matter against Brexit. The truth of the matter is I was biased in favour students of Parliament. The Speaker's responsibility is to support Parliament. It wasn't for me to be for Brexit and to try to use my position to make Brexit happen, or to be against Brexit and to try to stop Brexit happening. What I tried to do in a parliament where the government had no overall majority was to facilitate the House of Commons to decide what it wanted. And that didn't always make me very popular with the government of the day. I remember at one point the government chief whip coming into the chamber in a great fury about some ruling I'd made, and he banged the table by me, and I said, Julian, please don't bang the table. First of all, it's a threat to the wood, and secondly, it's rather discourteous. I should be most grateful if you would refrain from doing so. And he said to me, I was out of order. I mean, you know, I'm not going to be told the standing walls of the house by a government chief whip, for God's sake. You know, I knew what I was doing, and I, and I said, I'm sorry, Julian, I'm not out of order at all. He objected to the fact that I'd selected an amendment to a government motion, which he thought somebody had told him it was unamendable, and I said, it's not unamendable. It's not unamendable. And he was very nervous about the amendment. And I said, if you don't like Dominic Greaves' amendment, Julian, the answer is it's up to you to mobilise government MPs to vote against it. And if you defeat it, it's defeated. And the vote took place, and Mr Greaves, Dominic Greaves' amendment was passed. I felt I had good antennae for what the House wanted. I felt the House wanted the opportunity to vote on that amendment, and that's what I did. But... You know, the easiest way to avoid controversy is to do nothing. And, you know, I wasn't prepared to do that, so I did incur quite a lot of flack. But have I lost any sleep over that? No, I haven't. OK, we better, I better speed up. Yeah. Um, uh, next question, Ewa. When you go to a bar, what do you normally order? <laughs> In an Indian restaurant... A cobra. In an Italian or French restaurant, red wine. And in deep winter, when it's very cold, I've enjoyed whiskey. We have a special cocktail for you later, so don't worry. Um, anyone else with questions? Uh, yeah, girl in glasses, I think just the back. Relating to the legacy of reform within the House of Commons that you've yeah. addressed, does the abolition of the House of Lords represent a large enough step towards achieving meaningful political reform within the UK? I'm not sure that any one reform would be a large enough reform. I don't want to be pedantic, because that's a very good question. But do you understand me, students, if I say I don't think any one reform is likely to be enough? Because I think that reform is not really a fact, it's a process. It's not a matter of a single initiative, however significant. It's a question of constantly looking at your polity, at your democratic polity, and saying, how can we keep the best and improve the rest? I'm not in favour of change for the sake of change, but changing what needs to be changed. Do I think the House of Lords needs to be changed? Yes. I'm not sure I would use the word abolish. Uh, I understand that word is often used. Am I a, a unicameralist, that is to say... I didn't say unicorn, but a unicameralist, by somebody who believes in one chamber of parliament only. No, I'm a bicameralist. I believe in having a second chamber, which I think can sometimes offer pause for thought, say to a government, think again, take your time, this is a big step, it might be a mistake, what about the law of unintended consequence? And I think a, a second chamber can be a very good revising chamber, Moreover, I do accept that there are a lot of experts in the Lords. There are people of very considerable distinction in education, in science, in engineering, in the law, from academic life and so on. So I don't want to rubbish the House of Lords, and I don't. There are some very, very, very distinguished and good people in it. I must say it's far too big. All sorts of bizarre appointments have been made to the House of Lords over the years. People who've been given it as a bauble, as a prize, as a reward for loyalty to a particular leader at a given time, people who otherwise wouldn't have turned up in the House of Lords under any circumstances, and the House of Lords knows that. And I will be honest with you and say 
that I don't myself think in the modern age you can justify having a House of Parliament that is entirely unelected. I think that's ridiculous. I think you should have either a wholly or predominantly elected second chamber, possibly elected at a different time to the Commons and by a different voting method. And to people who say, and I, it's a very respectable argument that has to be met and countered head on, ah, but if you have that, won't that create unbearable tension with the Commons? Won't it lead to a battle for supremacy? The answer is a bit of tension between chambers in a parliament isn't a bad thing because it means that ideas clash and you sometimes get a better result from that clash. But I don't think it's a particular problem because I think all depends on whether there is a proper delineation of functions between the different houses. If you have a proper codification of what the powers of the Commons are and what the powers of the Lords are, you can get a good result. And if you want one illustration of why I was probably always rather an eccentric Conservative MP, even when I was a Conservative MP, in 2007, I think it was, when there were votes on reform options, which in the end got nowhere, I was the only Conservative MP to vote for the immediate removal from the House of Lords of all of the hereditary peers. The notion that somebody should be a member of the House of Lords as a result of the accident of birth is not only absurd, it is, in my opinion, in a modern democracy, offensive. Brilliant. I think we've got time for a couple of more. So one. if we go to, I think there's a girl at the back, yeah, over there. Um, hello. Um, you're very critical of the Conservative Party. Um, was there a specific turning point where you went from being in favour of it to being against it? I think that's a very fair question. I went through quite a period when I was happy still to be in the Conservative Party pursuing my own political causes, special educational needs provision, constitutional reform, LGBT equality, the fight against global poverty and so on. But I still fundamentally identified with the Conservative Party. During my period as Speaker, I very calculatedly didn't think about the party divide other than in terms of my responsibility in the House. So no, if, if you're asking was the, if you like, a Damascene conversion or was the one moment which suddenly made me think I want to support another party, no. The truth is that once I became Speaker, I felt completely detached from, independent of, largely uninterested in the party battle and interested just in being as good a Speaker as I could be. And it was only when I left office that I thought, well, you know, I'm not leaving office in my 80s, I'm leaving office in my 50s, and it's perfectly legitimate now I've left office to hold a political view. And I suppose the truth is that over a period of years, the honest answer to your question is not one moment, but over a period of years, I had become more left-wing. I'd moved really from about 2000 onwards to a more centrist position. And after I left office, I said to myself, I think I know what my values are. They're not extreme left. I believe in free enterprise, but I also believe in reducing the gap between the haves and the have-nots and facilitating social mobility and in what I would call an ambitious internationalism in global affairs. And I don't associate those characteristics with the Conservative Party. Individual Conservatives may hold those views. I'm not rubbishing all Conservatives as people with bad motives. I'm not saying that. But the Conservative Party doesn't represent that brand of politics, and I think the Labour Party does. So it was a gradual process rather than one moment of change. I'll happily take more. The, you, the person you've got to fight here is not me, <laughs> but your president. And who else? Whoever else. Um, let's go upstairs, sorry, quickly. Um, yeah. I don't know if there's a mic. You might have to shout. Oh, there's a mic. Brilliant. Um, in lieu of your passing over in the New Year's honour list, the private eye uh, cited you for the prestigious OBA, the Order of Bugger All. <laughs> Do you um, personally believe that your omission from the New Year's Honour List was a particularly vindictive attack by Boris Johnson in regard to your personal, somewhat, what he construed as opposition towards him? Do I feel what, did you say aggrieved? Um, yes. I mean, I was disappointed. 
I'll be honest with you, I was disappointed, and I would have gone to the House of Lords if I'd been offered the chance to do so, for two reasons. Partly because it had tended to be the normal expectation that a speaker on concluding his or her service to the House would be asked to go to the upper house. And so there was a sort of sense in which I thought, well, why shouldn't I? As it happens, just as a matter of fact, whether you think I was any good a speaker is for you to judge, not for me. I am the longest serving speaker in the post-war period. I was elected and re-elected more often than anybody else. I was elected and re-elected a total of four times, and I served for 10 years and four months. And, you know, there have been 10 post-war speakers, and I served longer than any of them. So I don't see why I shouldn't have been given that opportunity. But there was a very determined commitment to prevent me going. The second reason I'd quite like to have gone is that I would have wanted to be an active member contributing to debates. I feel I've got a lot of political experience. Some of you will agree with things I've said tonight, and others of you will disagree. But I was in the House for 22 years, and I do have a, a very active interest in public affairs, and I would like to have made a contribution. I don't think there's much point in persisting with grievance or feeling aggrieved. I think that, you know, it's much better to get on with life and, you know, do I lose sleep over it? No, absolutely not. It's not in the end that important. What's important is that you do your honest best. And I tried to make a difference. And I now spend time making a living to some extent with private sector activity, with lecturing, with speaking to commercial audiences. And I've actually got more time to see my own family, more time to go to football matches, more time to play tennis, more time to enjoy life. So I don't think it's sensible to get angry or to be bitter. It doesn't achieve anything. It's corrosive. And I think that, you know, the best approach is just to say, you adjust to the circumstances you're in and you make the best of it. I've had much good fortune. And I've been very lucky to have the opportunities I've had, for which I'm very grateful to my colleagues and my constituents and my staff and the staff of the House. And so a persona of Mr Angry... Uh, you know, would be undesirable for me and ill-judged. I'll happily take some more if the President will let us. Yeah, we could probably go for a little bit over if you're willing. Um, let's just go to man in the middle over there. Mr Speaker, um, we all know how you facilitated debates in the Parliament. Um, what would be your advice on enhancing debates? My own view is that there's a lot to be said for time limits on speeches. And although I'm not naturally a brief speaker, I never got told to sit down when there was a time limit because I didn't want the embarrassment of being told your time is up, sit down. I think there's a lot to be said given that more people tend to want to speak today than if you go back decades. It just is a much more egalitarian atmosphere, which is a good thing. So... The old attitude, which was you sit there for quite a long time and you listen and you learn and you don't say anything, that's gone. People are elected, they work for you and other websites are tracking what their MP is doing, how many questions he or she is asking, what debates they're speaking in and so on. So members want to make their presence felt. And I think it's better to have more people speaking for shorter periods. And so, you know, that is what I would be inclined to do. And I must say, I did often say to people... Brevity, including on a number of occasions they didn't like it, but I sometimes would say to a minister, I can think of one minister who left the house some time ago, and who was in love with lots of good causes, but he was in love with nothing more than the mellifluous sound of his own voice. <laughs> and he used to speak at very great length in answering questions. And I used to say to him, I say to the Secretary of State that the abridged rather than the war and peace version would be appreciated. <laughs> Should we go to the front row, just at the back over there? Um, thanks for coming, Mr. Verko. Um, Ms. Sort of rates for the last question. Do you think that cameras in the Commons have been a mistake? Because we're talking about oratory in the chamber, and now it feels, and a lot of ex-MPs feel, that rather than sort of sitting there and trying to persuade your colleagues to vote in specific ways, that you're sort of playing to the cameras and PNQs aren't for the members inside, but for the 30-second Facebook clip ad, which is going to be played in the next election. I don't know what your thoughts about that. I think what I would say to you is a number of things. First of all, you can't reverse cameras in the chamber, and you shouldn't try to do so. It is a democratising 
transparency creating move and I think that it's more positive than if you were to take the cameras away at a time when public confidence in politicians is not very high anyway. If you suddenly said, oh, well, because people sometimes behave in an indecorous manner or because they're playing to the gallery or because they're shouting too much or because they're too self-indulgent, therefore let's close it down and take the cameras out. I think that would be far worse. We've got the cameras. If you ask me honestly, do some people play to the gallery? Yes. But I think what I would say to you is don't conflate and confuse Prime Minister's questions with the rest of the week. Now, I know Prime Minister's questions is by a huge multiple the most commonly observed feature of Parliament. I know that. But it isn't representative of all Parliament. I think there's a case for it, even though it's often a shouting fest. I've lost count of the number of countries I've been to around the world where either MPs or civil society activists said to me, Mr Speaker, we wish in our country the Prime Minister had to come to Parliament each week to respond to questions. So all I would say is it's not great, but it's better than not having it. That's the first thing. And the second thing is the rest of the week is often much more low-key with very serious speeches and very good quality questioning and scrutiny, both in the chamber and in committees, which are often televised as well. So I don't think that the alternative to the present should be to shut it down. What we need is more glasnost, not less, more proceedings to be shown, and yes, there will be a few show-offs. You always get that. But I think people would see that the great majority of MPs are doing their best. Let's go over this side. Yeah, there's a woman in a, a grey jumper. Yeah. I think George wants to I'm talking to you. It is up to you. I have no idea what he wants to ask. Hi there. Um, firstly, thanks for speaking to us. Um, as you said, you're a speaker for 10 years. Uh, you're up close and personal with the beauty and the ugliness of Westminster, like none of us. Um, do you think the experience has made you more optimistic or less about the state of UK politics and like its future? In the immediate aftermath, I would have said less because I admit to you any occupant of the chair will have a view about public policy. And my private view was, and it became my public view, that Brexit is the most colossal foreign policy blunder of the post-war period. It is an act of massive economic, political and reputational self-harm, which is going to damage the country for some time to come. So immediately after I left, I must say, I felt in a way, quite downbeat about the prospects for the country. Now, I would say I'm relatively upbeat because I think that nothing is forever and I sense an appetite for change. I think that Parliament is instinctively more assertive than it was when I came in 25 years ago. And I think that those rights that members have acquired for themselves won't go away. Um, my successor will do some things differently. He won't do some things I did do, and he will do some things I didn't do. But there's quite a lot of continuity in British politics. I presided over a massive increase in urgent questions because I thought that was right, and a lot of that has continued. And MPs are not inclined just to sit back and accept what's thrown at them. And my sense is in the country there is an appetite for change. If I can put it very bluntly and I'm sorry if you think this is too blunt, there is a limit to how long people are prepared to be trodden underfoot without rising up in protest. And I don't mean by civil disobedience or unlawful activity. Our system is not a perfect democracy, but it is a democracy. And I think if people are dissatisfied, as they have manifold reason to be extremely discontented at present, they will strive to bring about change. And so I'm still very upbeat about parliamentary democracy. And nothing, I said nothing is forever. Brexit's a fact. It's happened. It's not going to be reversed anytime soon. But if you ask me, do I accept that it is permanent? No, I don't accept that it's permanent. I mean, there's a huge set of leaps required. 
a government would have to want to go back in and to feel that it could persuade the public to go back in. And we would have to persuade the European Union after being really quite the most disagreeable partner for over 40 years to allow us to go back in. So I'm not saying that's going to happen any time soon. But is it imaginable in my lifetime? It is. It's perfectly imaginable. And I would just very gently say to the Brexiteers, you cannot ignore the facts of the world in which we live. When I left office in 2019, the UK population accounted for 0.85% of the global population. By 2029, we will account for 0.75% of the global population. It's a big world out there, and whether it is the fight against climate change, the fight against human trafficking, the fight against identity theft, the fight against the drug barons, the fight against terrorism. These are global challenges, and they cannot be met by one country acting alone. And Mr Nigel Farage, the former leader of UKIP and the best-known Brexiteer in the country, is a most accomplished demagogue, but he is a demagogue. I always point out that he fought the Buckingham constituency against me in 2010, but I'm very delighted to report that the Buckingham constituency fought back, and therefore he was not elected. Nigel is entitled to go round the country saying, rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves, if he so wishes, but the reality of the matter is that that isn't the case. We are a medium-sized continental power. I'm as patriotic as the next person, but it's time this country got a realistic sense of what its strengths are and what its weaknesses are. And I think people are dissatisfied with the state of the country and they will vote for change in the short term on the domestic front. But in the medium to long term, I think there should be and will be a reappraisal of our position in relation to the world as a whole. I think we've got time for two more questions. So let's just go at the front. Thank you. Uh, moving the topic slightly away from politics. Um, Following their very impressive victories against Tottenham and Manchester United, how do you feel about the prospect of Arsenal's title challenge, given they are your beloved football club? Yes, I realise this is a... Thank you. Always certainly a divisive question, because you'll have very different footballing affiliations, and some of you won't be interested in football at all. I'm not inclined to be cocky about it, I'm an absolutely fanatical Arsenal enthusiast. I have two season tickets at Arsenal and I very rarely miss a home game. I was there on Sunday for the 3-2 win over Manchester United. I was, I was actually, between you and me, I was sitting with Adrian Dunbar, who plays Superintendent Hastings in the line of duty, and a guy called Alan Davis, who is a well-known television personality. And we, were, we were seated together and we were going absolutely potty in this very, very tense, exhilarating match and we hugged when Arsenal won 3-2. I think we've got a chance. I think the Arsenal team is the best team I've known for at least 15 years. I'm a bit concerned about our squad depth. I'm not sure we've got enough depth in the squad so we need to avoid injuries in the coming weeks and I think Man City are a formidable opponent. So if you say to me, you know, are you saying John it's a racing cert. I'd be mad to say that. I don't think it's a racing cert at all. But I think Arsenal are in with a chance of winning the Premier League. And I don't mind admitting to you that I... I mean, I love the current team. I think there's some fantastic players. My favourite Arsenal player at the moment is Bukayo Saka, who is just a, a wonderfully talented player. And also, students, as a role model, you know, he's down-to-earth, he's gracious, he's level-headed... He's got a nice smile on his face. He works hard. And when he was questioned the other day about the match, you know, and did this mean that we were en route and so on, he was very quick to say, well, of course, you know, it was a very good result, but we must remain humble, he said. We've got a lot of work still to do. And I thought, this guy is 21, and he's got the shoulder, you know, he's got a 50-year-old head on 21-year-old shoulders. And I'm, I haven't met him, but I'm a big admirer of his. Oh, and for the last question, yes, there's a woman at the back. Thank you. Um, having in mind your change of heart towards like immigration and migration to Britain, um, would you have anything to say to international students about how best we can face the hostility that this country is showing to us following Brexit and the Rwanda program? Thank you. 
how, how can you face, sorry, I missed that last bit, forgive me, hostility? Sorry, yeah, the hostility. What's, what's the best way for students, for international students that seek to work in and for Britain to deal with the hostility and maybe find trust in this? I think I would say, be yourselves and work on the basis that in the end, most people, when they meet you one-to-one, -one, most at all reasonable people will make a judgment about you rather than about a whole class of people or a whole country. And sometimes in the media, the most grotesque caricatures are created of what immigrants are like, as though they're not individuals, but, you know, they're pieces in a jigsaw or they're part of some wider picture. They're human beings who have come to this country for whatever reason and who are trying to contribute to it and to benefit from it. And, you know, I remember a, a friend of my family once telling me that the, the media were very hostile to asylum seekers. Well, we know that. And this friend of our family knew of a resident in her quite remote part of Scotland who was an asylum seeker who was being threatened with deportation. And he was one of the only asylum seekers to live in the community. He was recognisably very different from the local inhabitants. He was an absolutely delightful human being. And when the Home Office, in a very boneheaded and clumsy fashion at the time, tried to get rid of him. The community rose up in his support because they knew that he was a person of good instincts and good values and good behaviour. And so I suppose I would say, be yourself and work on the basis that fair-minded people will value for that. If there's a proportion of people who still treat you with hostility through their own ignorance and their own bigotry and their own unpleasantness, to be honest, that says more about them than it does about you. And, you know, I remember once when I was Chancellor of Essex University, my old university, speaking at a graduation ceremony, and I couldn't resist including, some of you may know, I, or may not know, but I welcomed President Obama when he came to visit the British Parliament in 2011, one of my proudest moments introducing him to an audience of about 1,700 in the hall, but millions of people around the world. But I was very determined to prevent Donald Trump coming to address the British Parliament because I thought he'd behaved appallingly. He didn't have a right to come, and I was determined to try to block him coming. And I'm pleased to say I think I was successful in that regard. He didn't come. But I remember speaking at Essex University, and Donald Trump had just made appallingly bigoted and misogynist remarks about a number of female legislators who dared to criticise him. And some of them were of minority ethnic heritage. And he said, well, if they don't like America, they can go back to where they came from. This was a man occupying the highest office in the world. And that was the degree of bigotry that he exhibited. Now, unfortunately, with him, you couldn't say, don't worry about him. He had to be fought. And he was fought, successfully fought and defeated. But if you meet people who are not in very powerful positions and they're just unpleasant and you carry on being the good person you are and they can't cope with it, you sometimes just have to accept that there will be a minority of people who are like that. If they break the law, if they discriminate against you in a way that is illegal, well, then, of course, you can act. But I always say you can't make people think what they don't think and you can't make them not think what you, they do think. But what you can do is be the best version of yourself. And if I may very politely say to you, I hope I have this audience with me in saying this, my gripe against the most bigoted parts of the tabloid press is this. I think most people, when they reflect upon the issues calmly and quietly and dispassionately in the round, would accept that the vast majority of the minority ethnic population of this country, including those of them that are immigrants, millions of them were born here, but those of them who are immigrants are contributing beneficially to this country and are welcome here. And the United Kingdom is in every way 
a richer, broader, more diverse, more inclusive and more impressive country for the fact of generations of immigration. If there's a small minority of people, either in the media or amongst the electorate, who have a racist opposition to people of minority ethnic heritage, there is no cure for them. We can't do anything about them beyond argue in a civil way. I think most people realise that immigration on the whole has been very good for Britain. And overseas students are extremely good for our universities. Thank you very much. As a final quick question, which I'm going to ask all the people that come to the union this term, what is a book or a movie that you would recommend? The book I enjoyed most was A Tale of Two Cities by Dickens. It's my favourite Dickens novel. There are lots of other books I could recommend, but I think that's the one I'd go with. If you ask me my favourite film, well, I fear I'm going to be cheeky and abuse my position and say, I'd like to name two. The two films I'd like to name are a Clint Eastwood film, which you may or may not have seen, called Pale Rider, which is a favourite film of mine. I see nodding from one of the unit officers in the front row. It's a fantastic film. It's a bit of a tearjerker. I have a reputation in my family in watching sort of romantic films for welling up. I do tend to get quite emotional and my wife and sometimes my kids tease me about it. You may not think that I'm that sort of person, but I am actually quite a romantic type. And if there's a story of goodies versus baddies, you know, I like to see the goodies win. Pale Rider is a wonderful film. But it's very, very tough. I think my favourite film, as measured by the number of times I've watched it, probably to the incomprehension of my family is a film called The Gathering Storm. And The Gathering Storm, students, is a film about Churchill in the wilderness years in the 1930s when he was warning about German rearmament. And he was out of office and largely loathed by the Conservative establishment and treated very badly by them, by Chamberlain and by Stanley Baldwin. I mean, Churchill could give as good as he got, by the way. I mean, he did once say about... Baldwin, I don't wish to be unkind or discourteous or uncharitable about Stanley Baldwin. I don't bear him personal ill will. It's just that upon the whole, I think it would have been better for the world uh, if he had never been born. <laughs> but anyway, that film, The Gathering Storm, Albert Finney plays Churchill and Vanessa Redgrave plays Clemmy, his wife. And it's a wonderful film, and at the end... Of, anyway, I shouldn't really tell you what the end is, but there's a positive ending of it from Churchill's point of view and from the point of view of the future direction of the country. It's also got wonderful moments of good humour. My wife always reminds me that it is, of course, a film, so there's quite a lot of creative licence. It's not the case that every single scene is an exact reflection of what happened. But there's quite a lot, I think, that did happen in that family and in British politics at the time that is very accurately portrayed. And, you know, it's an immensely stimulating film, and it's not very long. I think it's about an hour and 34 minutes, and it's brilliantly acted. And I think the... Probably the... I think probably the most amusing scene is when Churchill is dictating a letter to his wife, who is away on a long sojourn, across Africa and elsewhere. And the butler, Inches, played by Ronnie Barker, comes in and says, excuse me, sir, there's a telephone call. Out, Inches, I'm busy. It's extremely urgent, sir. And Churchill says, I, I, gosh, you're the most irritating clod that ever trod the face of the earth, Inches. And Inches sort of says, well, no need to be discourteous. Anyway, 
you can tell Churchill's really annoyed, and he, he says, I'm in the middle of dictating a letter to my wife, Finches. Have you no sensitivity? He's in a really bad mood. Anyway, he eventually says, who is it? <laughs> and the butler, Ronnie Barker, says, it's Major Sankey, sir. And the truth is, this guy, this clodpole, is on the phone to give Churchill a hard time at the request of the Conservative whips. And Churchill says, who is he? And the butler says, he's your local Conservative Association chairman, sir. So Churchill clearly hasn't got the slightest idea who Major Sankey is. And he goes out of the room and he comes back and he's in a very foul mood. And he blames it all on Baldwin, quite accurately. Baldwin has basically said to the Tory whips, get in touch with Churchill's association and get them to stir it up a bit and tell them they're unhappy with him for rebelling against government policy and so on. I mean, it's an absolutely brilliant film. So if I haven't bored you rigid by the idea, I suggest you look at it. Brilliant. Um, just a couple of announcements. There's another speaker. Russ, the rapper, is here tomorrow, and that's our last. If you want to come. <laughs> that's the last Who event. Its name's Russ. Russ? Russ. You might know him. <laughs> but that's the last event of our open period. If you're still um, not a member, you can buy discounted membership on the website with further discounts available based on financial need. Our debate this Thursday is on press power and accountability, so I look forward to seeing you all there. And can we once again thank John for joining us. Thank you.